Our reading today comes from Ephesians 4, 17 through 20, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 20. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. Good morning. We are thankful each one is here with us uh, this morning. Uh, I was able to speak with Sister Doris. Brother Chris was doing the announcements this morning. I was out there talking, so he didn't know this because I was outside. But uh, Sister Doris is doing better after her uh, recent vaccination shot. She is very tired, but we do want to keep her in our prayers that she continues to improve and uh, feel better very quickly. I know we have several our number who have gotten the uh, vaccination shot here recently and have had similar uh, issues and so we do want to keep them in our prayers. I know uh, the dentists were scheduled to have uh, his on, on Friday or theirs on Friday and so we do want to keep them uh, in our prayers. Uh, that was this past Friday. So we do want to keep them in our prayers as they are uh, doing uh, well and they're going to be able to uh, be back with us as soon as possible. Our lesson this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, previously, and we were looking at really kind of an overview of each chapter. We're not going to do so much of that this week with chapter 4. As we have talked many times in the past about, especially verses 1 through 6, uh, concerning the one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and those types of things. Uh, we also know verse 7 and following that the Apostle Paul deals with uh, spiritual gifts, and he talks about how the Lord has given individuals to be apostles and prophets and things such as that. But our focus this morning, I chose to be, was from verse 17, and really verse 17 through about verse 24, <coughs> looking at uh, what, we, what the Apostle Paul refers to as a new man or a new creature in Christ. We know the Apostle Paul commonly talks about putting off the old man and, and putting on the new man, and how we are not to walk in the old ways of wickedness and those types of things. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17 and following. We know as we look at this chapter and we look at what the Apostle Paul is going to be discussing, we know that if we're going to be a faithful servant of God, that we have to put off certain things. I know that many of us realize that when someone becomes a Christian, there probably are things they're involved in that are not sinful. Things which they are perfectly fine with continuing in because they do not go against the Word of God and they do not go against God's commandments. But we also realize that when we become a Christian, we also realize that there are things we're most definitely going to have to bring to an end. If we're going to be pleasing the sight of God, and those things must come to a close prior to us obeying the gospel. As we know, the repentance is part of the plan of salvation, it does precede baptism. We find to begin in Ephesians chapter 4, just as uh, Brother Paul read for us a moment ago there from our scripture reading, uh, our key text is going to be verses 17 through 20 where the, where the Apostle Paul says, he testifies in the Lord that we should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. We think about this idea of the new man and not walking like those who have walked in sin in the past. I want you to think back for a moment in a time when you are not a Christian. For some of us, that may be a lot longer than others. So think, of back, think back to that time period in which you were not a Christian before you obeyed the gospel and think back to how you used to live. And really, think back to how your mindset once was before you obeyed the gospel. It's still interesting to me, and I don't mean this to sound haughty or anything like that, but it's interesting to me to think about individuals who become in contact with worldly people and really their thought process about things and what they feel about things and some things that many times that they have never really considered. Now we know some people have considered things and they just choose not to, to listen or to, to follow it for whatever reason. But those who are in the world today have a much different thought process than that of a person who has obeyed the gospel. 
We begin by looking at Ephesians 4, verse 17, where we find this idea that we should no longer walk like the rest. We should no longer walk like the rest. I titled it that because... The Gentiles really is being, is being used in the sense that we don't walk like the rest of the world. And this is going to sound a whole lot like what we discussed a little bit this morning. This was not my intention when we did our Bible class and we talked about Ephesians. It has gone really a lot of times hand in hand, although that was not really the, uh, my purpose. But we find here in verse 17 and 18 that the Apostle Paul tells us we are not to be like the world. He says, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord... He says that you no longer should walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. You think about that phrase, you should no longer walk. If someone says we're no longer doing that, it means they have stopped it, right? Down here, not too far from our house, we have the highway maintenance department. They have a big sign out there. It's been out there for weeks and weeks. It says no longer accepting brush. You know what that means? They're no longer accepting brush. That's exactly what it means. If we're no longer walking like the rest of the Gentiles, it means that we should no longer walk like the rest of the Gentiles. There is something that is in the past that once was taking place that's not anymore. We no longer do those things. We should not walk. That is, we should not live as the rest of the Gentiles live. That's literally what he's talking about. Walking, it many times is used as a way to describe our daily life. You don't walk, you don't live. He says, as the rest of the Gentiles, or as the rest of the world, lives. He goes on to say here in verse 17, he says, in the futility of their mind. That literally means with a depraved mind. It doesn't, see, it doesn't take very long to look at the world today, and they can see how they look at things, see how ungodly people, worldly people, non-Christians, look at so many things. And we can see how, no doubt, the world has a very depraved mind. You hear people talk about certain sins and trying to be all-inclusive of different groups. And we can see the world is, no doubt, very depraved. And the world will refine where Dr. Seuss is canceled in the, the song of the year, so grotesque, I can't tell you the name from the pulpit. That's the world we live in. We are not to be like the world. We are not to have that depraved Mind, as we find here in verse 17. He says, The Gentiles walk in the futility, or they walk in their depraved mind. We are not to be like that. He says, No longer walk as they do. We have a change of mind. Paul talks about those there in Romans, how they were to be renewed with their mind, right? That is, their mind literally is to change from the old ways into this new way, a way that is pleasing to God. He goes on to say in verse 18, He says, Having their understanding darkened. Paul says they're in a, it's because they're ignorant that so they are separated from God and it's like living in darkness. He says having the understanding darkened, being alienated or separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. He says a lot in verse 18, doesn't he? About why they are where they are. He says having their understanding darkened. You know, usually sometimes when you talk to someone you don't understand something, sometimes you say, will you enlighten me, which means tell me what this means, explain it, right? Enlighten me, tell me what that means. Darkened means what? That you don't know what the truth is, and you don't want to know it. You want to stay in the dark. Sometimes we use the phrase, I want to stay in the dark about some things. And some things, there are some things that I don't have any desire to know anything about. But when it comes to religious matters, we cannot be in the dark. He says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated or separated from the life of God. Because why? He says, because of the ignorance that is in them. You know, some people look at that and say, that's so offensive. He he says they're ignorant, that's why they're living that way. That's exactly right. Until a child is taught better, they live in ignorance about certain things, right? Right? Until you know what the truth is and how things really are, we're going to be ignorant about certain things. And the Apostle Paul says here in verse 18, they're living in darkness, they're living with a depraved mind, their understanding is darkened, they're separated from God, it's all because of their ignorance and because of the blindness of their heart. They don't want to walk with God. And their ignorance is the reason why. He goes on to say in verse 18, because of the blindness 
of their heart. He's not talking about the little pump in their chest. He's saying their, their mind is blind to things. It's interesting we talk to people today, even those who proclaim to be a Christian, how many things they are completely oblivious. <laughs> those who, who maybe you have those who when they hear someone teach, they completely miss the false teaching they, they, they have just heard. Maybe it's those who just simply don't understand the basic concepts we might call the milk of the Word of God. And there are those who see things that are completely simple and go against the Word of God and they don't realize it. They just don't grasp that. And we find here in verse 18, he says the same idea. Blindness of their heart. They're blind. They're ignorant. And what happens because of that? They're alienated from God. In verse 19, we find that some gave themselves over. What we mean by that, some gave themselves over to sin. They just gave up and said, just let sin sweep me away. You ever turn on your radio, maybe if you have a music service of some type, and you start scrolling through the different artists, maybe pick a, pick a category and start scrolling through their top songs of whatever time period. It's amazing what you can learn by song titles, by what kind of world we live in. I was scrolling through one of the day, it was country songs, don't make fun of me, but it was country songs, and most of them had to deal with either beer or cheating or something of that nature. Beer, cheating, or cuss cursing right there in the title. I thought, this, is kind of, this describes the world, doesn't it? Almost every other song, this is about beer, this is about cheating, this is about alcohol, this is about all these other things, almost one after another, which reminds me, I hope it reminds you as well, why we should be careful what we're listening to. Well, the world says it's popular, so what? It doesn't mean it's true on the side of God. Think about the kind of people who decide, well, this is a popular song. This is a song of the year. You ever really hear the kind of people they have to choose those things? So the most depraved and twisted people you'll probably ever meet. We're letting them decide what is a good song? No. That's not how we do those things. Look at verse 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with with, with, uh, greediness. These individuals have given themselves over fully to sin, who being past feeling mean they have lived this way in the past, and they have just given themselves completely to it. Completely to sin. Think about how many events in our nation today are derived around sin. How many places are known for their sinful activities? We even know one that's called Sin City, right? We even know those events like Mardi Gras, for instance, and others that are surrounded and engrossed with complete sin which no Christian should ever be a part of. These individuals in Ephesians 4, verse 19, they give themselves over to such things. He says, over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness, with greediness. They were in sin, they were completely covered in sin, and they were not intending to depart from it. But we continue reading next, we notice, again, this is talking about those individuals who were in sin, who were doing all these wicked things, but then we find, you must say, the script is flipped in verse 20, right? Where the Apostle Paul says, but you, talking to the new Christian." talking to the person who has obeyed the gospel. He says, but you, he's making a distinction there. The world does this, but you, look at verse 20. The Christian has been taught better. He says, but you have not so learned Christ, which means you have not learned these things from Christ. You ever hear someone say, they didn't learn that from me. But the meaning is, whatever thing has just happened, it means they, they didn't learn that from me. They didn't get that from me. And that's what we find here in verse 20. But you have not to learn Christ. The, sin, the Christian does not learn sinful things like what we just talked about from Christ. Verse 21, it says, If you indeed have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, what is He saying? If you have learned the gospel and have really obeyed it and followed it, He says, you'll know that you haven't learned those things from Christ. You haven't learned all those wicked things. Those who have been taught the truth know how to live. If we have indeed put off the old man of sin, then we are not to follow the sinful ways of the world. 
We continue reading in verse 23 through verse 24. He says we are to put off the old man. Some of the most well-known phrases of the Apostle Paul include this section about putting off the old man. Because why? It's a constant battle. And it's a very real thing we have to deal with. Looking at verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 4, he says that you put off concerning your, now notice here, your former conduct. For the Christian, it is former conduct. Not conduct, but former conduct. To put it off means you put it away and you don't let it come back. And if it does ever come back and sneak in and lure us away, we repent of those things and we kick it back to the curb where it belongs. We don't allow those things to come back into our life in verse 22. That you put off concerning your former conduct. He says the old man, which is a reference to the old sinful way of life, the person who used to live in sin, he's not talking about age, he's talking about the old ways of doing things. The old man, he says, which grows, which grows corrupt according to, to the deceitful lust. Corrupt can also be used to describe something that's deteriorating, something that's crumbling. Have you ever seen someone's outside, for instance, porch, it's wood, and you see it, a picture when they first built it 20 years ago, and you see it, you see it now, as you walk out there, you probably think, I'm not going to step out there because that thing's just going to fall apart. You hear it creaking, and you see the holes start to develop, you hear the wood, you know, you see the wood where it's weakened, you see the, the joints where it's together, it's starting to rot. And that's how you describe sin. That over time it just eats it and eats it and eats it away until it just, it's just crumbling away. He says, the old man which, grow, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. It's because of the deceitful lust that the old man is growing corrupt. Instead, we find in verse 23 what the Christian is to do. He says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You put off the old man, and what do you do? You are renewed in the spirit of your mind. That means you change the way you think which is also no doubt a big part in how we obey the gospel. Why do we repent? Because we're changing the way we, we think about things. We recognize that these things I've been doing, they're wrong. And so for that reason, I'm going to do what? I'm going to repent, and then I'm going to confess and be baptized. Because why? Because it all starts, as we mentioned many times before, back in the mind, right? We hear it, we believe, that's a big part in the mind. We repent, showing that our mind is working, it's causing us to repent of our sins because we are convicted by what we have been doing. And then we confess Christ and we move forward obeying God's plan of salvation. You are renewed in the spirit of your mind. He says and that you put on the new man, which was, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So we, we are renewed in our mind. We change the way we think, which is going to result in change the way we act which includes leading us to obedience to the gospel, and that you put on the new man, which we know as the Apostle Paul talks about, and as Peter talks about in Acts chapter 2, happens at baptism, right? We put on the new man, we are baptized into Christ. We find that in Romans chapter 6. We are buried with Christ in baptism, we're raised up in the new creation. We are a new creature. And what are we? What? He says that the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. When we obey the gospel, we begin to we we just have begun our life in Christ, and we continue obeying God. We obey the word of God, and then we continue to do so. We are to have this change in mind. If you continue reading here in verse twenty four, he says that you put off these things, right? If we continue reading, you drop down. In verse 25 and following, he continues talking about putting away lying, how we are not to be, our ways to be angry, but not sin, how we are not to give place to the devil, we are not to steal any longer, let no corrupt word proceed of our mouth. Verse 29, we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit, that is, we, that is, we are not to blaspheme God. We are to what? All bitterness, wrath, verse 31, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And in verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. He doesn't just tell us how to become the new man. He tells us the things we are to do to maintain that new man. Putting away certain things and putting on new things. Some lessons for us today. Old ways should stay old ways. 
Some things in the Christian life deserve to be outdated. The life of sin deserves to be outdated. Don't worry about updating it. Leave it where it is. Leave that old man in the tomb and do not go back to that way of sin. Old ways should stay old ways. No longer, as we find in verse 17, shows a change. He says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer. There's a change. You're no longer doing those things. We are to be new in Christ. Sinful lifestyles must be, to an end, must be put to an end. This doesn't mean we're going to have to lead perfect lives because we're going to fail. But the difference between, a, between the old man and the new man is the new man recognizes where we fall short and we repent. We bring those things to God and we repent of those things. And thus we can remain the new man. The old man would have never done that, would he? He or she would have never done that. The new man is quite the opposite. Only a new life in Christ brings eternal life. If we're going to have eternal life, we better make sure we are in Christ. Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27 tells us, For it means we're baptized into Christ, verse 27, have put on Christ. We must put on Christ and be obedient to Him and His command that we are to have heaven as our home. A new life in Christ brings hope, healing, and fellowship with God. Hope for the future, healing because of the forgiveness of our sins, and a fellowship with God because we have put on Christ in baptism. When people talk about healing sometimes, they want to make it some denominational sense of healing. The healing comes because we have repented of our sins and we know that we are right inside of God. We have been spiritually healed and since we obeyed the gospel, we're no longer growing corrupt. Instead, we are being renewed in our mind day by day. A new life in Christ brings hope, healing, and fellowship with God. We are new creatures in Christ, so we must strive to live like it. We're going to make mistakes, but you know what? We own up to it. We make it right. If the world sees us make a mistake, let them also see us correct it. If it's public, take care of it publicly. If it's not, take care of it other ways. But we make sure that we, make a, we have some type of sin in our life that we correct it. The old man would not bother, but the new man does. And there is a difference. The Christian, as we think about these things as well, the Christian will do their utmost not to give Satan a foothold in their life. Ephesians 4, verse 27 says, Nor give place to the devil. Leave no room for Satan. And we will fill our lives with things that are good, things that are positive, things that are approved of in the sight of God. There will be nowhere left for evil to have a seat. We will do what is right in the sight of God. We will make our time filled with things that are family-oriented, God-oriented, and so on. There will be no time left for anything else. Certain times in our life we may be overrun with hardships, but how we react is going to determine how God is going to view us at that time and in the future. Whether we're talking about stress, we're talking about family loss, or whatever it may be, how do we react? Do you remember how Christ reacted in times of intense pressure? The Bible reveals at least it seems to me, that Christ would go alone, go away by Himself and He would pray. Remember after He fed the thousands of people and He healed them, He sent the disciples on a boat across the sea that He would later walk upon? While they were doing that, what did He do? The Bible says He went, went up on a mountain by Himself to pray. The Garden of Gethsemane, before He was arrested and taken to the joke of a trial, He was in the garden alone and He prayed what seems to be possible for hours. He prayed when things grew difficult or painful. We today must take that and follow that same example. When you think about putting on this new man and putting off the old man, do you remember the words of the writer of Ecclesiastes in the final chapter of Ecclesiastes? He tells us as he thinks about all those things that he had enjoyed, right? Right? We know in chapter 1 and chapter 2 he says, Whatever his eyes desired, he did not keep them from him. Whatever he wanted to do, he did it, right? But he also tells us, towards the end of his writing there in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, what does he say about what it all means? Remember, this is a man who had everything. He had houses, he had gardens, he had servants, he had multiple wives, all those things. He was a man, if he wanted to grow more knowledgeable, he did so. 
But when he came to the very end of all his testing, as he says there in chapter 1, at the end of chapter 12, what does he say? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. He says, when all comes down to what do we need to do? Obey God and fear Him. Or as he would say, fear God and keep His commandments, right? Because He will bring everything to judgment. So what does that mean for us? We better make sure that we are living a life that is pleasing to God. Think about this for a second. If you know a person who was who once was worldly, they were wicked, they were sinful, they did evil things, they did worldly things, and all of a sudden it seemed like that person no longer existed. And they began to be someone else. What does the Apostle Paul call that? Someone who had put off the old man, or so it seemed, and put on the new man. Because when the old man puts away his sin and puts on Christ, it would become to me in the world today as if that person, we don't know who they are anymore. You ever hear that phrase? I don't know who you are anymore. I don't know who they are anymore. Why? Because they change. That's not always a bad thing. Because the Apostle Paul talks about how that is exactly what God wants from us. The old man of sin, the old person of sin, put him in the grave. And rise up in Christ, a new creature. Romans chapter 6. As you think about these things this morning, let's be mindful of what the Apostle Paul encourages us to do, this inspired man of God. How we must, if we're going to have heaven as our home, put on Christ and keep Him on to the very end. And that is to be faithful to God. Put Him on and to keep Him on so that we can have heaven as our home. This morning, as you think about these things, we can help you or encourage you in any way. You can come forward now. Let's get we stand and sing the song that's been selected. We praise thee, O God, for the love.